I'm Eric Chummy, and this is Politely Pushy. Welcome to Politely Pushy. I'm your host, as always, Eric Chummy. Today, I am joined by Adrian Bridgewater. It's the first time in a while I've talked to someone from England, from Britain, from UK, and I'm going to figure out from you exactly which one of those terms I'm supposed to use because I always get confused. But Adrian's been a journalist at major top tier publications, Forbes, Computer Weekly, Tech Target, like so many places I, I see your work. So Adrian, thanks so much for joining me here today. And I'm, I'm glad that, as you point out, we both have the white t-shirts going on today. Very summer yeah. vibes right now. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Eric. It's... Um... Yeah, thank yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, engaging me with me on this. Um, I am. I'm in. I'm based in quite central London, um, in a place called Battersea, right next to. If you've ever seen the front cover of Pink Floyd's Animals album with the uh, with the power station on it, I'm really quite close to there. Um, that's in England. That's in the UK. That's in Great Britain and uh, the British Isles of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I think we have a about seven names for our nation so uh it's uh it's it's it's, it's fluid but be, i just say england usually you say england but then do i call you a british person an english person like are you english or are you british if i have to pick one it's not offensive just to call us brits actually brits we okay. don't mind it we don't you mind have it. some experience in the states your wife is american from maryland the the back and forth what do you what do you notice media wise between the two cultures? Cause I feel like there's a very different kind of media culture in terms of, Hey, in America, they talk about you have freedom of speech in England. You don't necessarily have that. There's more rules about what you can say, what you can't say. How do you navigate between those two? Or from your point of view, does this not seem to be much of a difference in actual work? Um, <clears throat> it's a hell of a question. Um, there's, I mean, if you think even not just in a in a in an IT environment interview, at a press conference or a, or any event, um, there might be a perception among some Europeans that the Americans have occasionally been perceived as as offering a lot more softball questions, um, and I think that's sometimes the case, but very rarely in hardcore. I mean, I cover software application development and data science, data management, cloud, AI, open source, and those kind of things. And the, any senior journalist in that field doesn't turn up and just say, you know, great keynote, thank you, tell us about your platform and roadmap. People are quite in-depth. And, um, I, you know, in terms of differences, it's, it's there is, you know, it's most it's it's very very close in terms of the way we do things um i think the um i think there are there's a there's a breed of older journalists in the us you know that i'm sure i think you probably go along with that they you know career guys and ladies that have done it for for 40 years which you know I, i'm only i'm 30 years in the job myself so um the, I think if the UK has got anything, there's a, there's be a lot more twenty year olds around, and I don't see those that youth um, on on the circuit so much. Um, maybe they're still I don't know what they're doing, but you know, there's, it, it, you know if if it's good stuff and that you've got both sides of the Atlantic doing um, their job properly, the only real difference is in the spelling, you know, and then a lot of people, a lot of the Brits are using a, a Z and a Z. Uh, much more than the S that we're supposed to. Um, Colour has still got a U in it, but you know what I mean. This, this, it's things are things are quite close. Does that end up tripping you up? Because depending on the outlet you're writing for, do they want it? Okay, we want it in the American way. Do we want it in the British way? Do you say no? I'm only doing it colour with a U, and and you can be damned if you're going to take that U out. How, how does that? How do you fight that battle? No, have you never driven a car on the other side of the street? You don't. You just do it when you're in, when you're in the mode. You don't look for the gear stick or you automatic or all of the cars in the US. But you know, you 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 absolutely just switch. Um, it's completely instinctual. It's not a it's not a thing. What is the journey for you? How did you get here? Because so many people who write about technology, they need to have both skills. They need to have left brain, right brain, right? I want to be creative. I want to be making content and something that is, you know, writing is not the same as being technical. It's rare to find an ability to be able to understand and do both of those skill sets. So were you a technology person at first or were you always a writer at heart? How did you get to this? I was a hobbyist programmer. Um, 
No, and I know that you're a trained professional in, in, in that sense. Um, and I was, um, I was a, 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 you know, I was a writer and a, I mean, I actually traced back 25 years ago. Um, it was very, very, I think it's a lot easier now for you, if you just want to, you can have a blog and be sort of published immediately, so to speak. Um, so 25, 30 years ago, I, I actually worked in, in on the PR side. Um, for a big U.S. agency that I, I don't think exists at all anymore, it used, used to be called Broder, uh, and um, and I worked in the on their Middle East office for three years, and I worked in the in the London office, and I, I was just um, trying to take my technical hobbyist past into a media sphere where I might one day speak to a publication that said, you know, actually. Your, uh, you know, your, your, some of the content that you give us is great. We need a deputy, de deputy editor, and that's exactly what happened. One of them actually said, "We've got an opening." Um, you come across like a, you know, like a writer, like a, like a, like a reporter, like a journalist. So I, I, I sort of joined the dots to do what I wanted to do, which was writing. Um, and very early stage stuff was. Um, I, I, I cropped up on ZDNet UK years and years ago. Um, but there was a little period before that when you're writing for retail news or pharmaceutical weekly Middle East. And, you know, I did all the l really lowest hanging, <laughs> not lowest hanging fruit, all the lowest of the low grade jobs in those really niche titles just so i could go into other places and say look there's a byline it's been printed i know what i'm doing and um yeah quarter of a century on i'm yeah as you as you mentioned i'm uh been lucky enough to work with forbes and computer weekly which are um also with a, a very up and coming dutch uh say up and coming it's the biggest in the country a dutch uh site called Texine, um and um they uh, they uh, they write in English and Dutch, and uh, also um, a little work with Textron Group as well. So you know it's um, it's been a progression. Does that answer the question? That's a good that's a good answer. You mentioned you had worked in PR agency early on. How does that affect your dealings with the ecosystem when you're getting pitches? You're working with PR, whether it's agencies or the in-house uh, parts of the company. You must have a much better sense for it. I know what your angle is. I've seen these tricks. I, 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 how do you work with them knowing that you've been on that side of it before? Well, I mean, it's kind of hard work when you get sent a survey by a data management security company because they generally find that data management security adoption is on the rise or needs extra. But you know what I mean? It's kind of like, don't give us the blatant spin, please. Um I know it's not exactly what you ask. You ask me like, can I see through it? I think any journalist can, um, if they know what half, you know, if they're worth their salt and they know what they're doing. Um, what it translates to in terms of, I always said when I first started, when I when I'd really moved over, and I know that a lot of people go from journalism into PR, they, or the, you know, they, in their later years, they may take those kind of contracts. I moved the other way, and I said I would be extremely um sympathetic to the pr cause and i try to be um but because i know how when it's done well and when it's done badly i can see more quickly uh low quality stuff people don't research things they don't know who you are it's just a name on a on a media list and and so i i kind of um i try and be as charitable as possible but it, it's it's hard to not react against really bad sloppy stuff and there is sloppy stuff out there you know the good you you know when you're dealing with good professional communications agencies or individuals they you know they they work hard they look at what you do um and there's there's um you know there, there's different levels um so it's it's you know does, does it enable me to see through the the spin i think we can all see through the the real the really crass stuff um but you know we, we but good pr is a lot like good journalism you know where the story is uh even if you're on the pr side the vendor that you're supporting thinks they've got one story you know you, it, it, you, you can tell when you're working with an agency that's told the, the, their client that they need to tell a story like this 
because they know what the media is interested in. So, you know, that's, that's how it kind of switches really. What is it like primarily being freelance at a lot of these top tier outlets, right? Some people we talk to, they're just, Hey, I work for one shop. I get my salary and I just do what my one boss tells me to do. It's a little more hierarchical. What is the experience like for you? How did you choose that path and the pros and cons of, Hey, I, I got to hustle a little bit. I've got different outlets depending on what I'm working on, different bosses, different cadences. What is that like? What is that timeline like? It's, it, I, I mean, to be honest, my day starts with Computer Weekly Tech Target. Same thing. Uh, Tech Target owns Computer Weekly. Um, and I, I, you know, that's kind of a daily thing. Um, I try and do that. that that's every single day. Um, and I, I, I do a fair amount with Forbes as well. And um, I, I, I think that to switch between one to the other, it doesn't, it's not a difficult um, thought process as to which story would go where. I can, uh, they could be interchanged, but generally not ever. You know, the computer, the computer weekly work is, is, is much closer to sort of talking about uh, the command line for a developer uh, in, in, in developer terms, it's, it's, you know, we, we stopping short of code listings. We would go into quite specific detail, um, about the, um, the, you know, uh, the, the structure of any particular, uh, uh, technology story Forbes, we're not do- trying to do the business angle, but we, you know, if we, if we mentioned APIs, we'd probably describe them as some kind of glue that interfaces between different application services, components, and, and other elements. Um, so, you know, it's 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 having three or four or five different interests is. I mean, I thought that's what freelancers did. Don't they all do that? They they all do that. It's it's more like. Do you do you like it this way? Do you prefer it this way? Do you did you have opportunities that maybe you turned down and say, "Hey, I'm just going to do one thing and one thing only for one shop all the time." I, uh, well, thanks for asking that. No one's ever really asked that. Um, yeah, I got asked to be an editor again last year for one title. And I'd already done, I've already been, an, I've been a magazine editor using Adobe InDesign, filling 80 pages per month. And I don't want to do it again. <laughs> it's just, um, you know, I, and, and, the, and the publisher was uh, charming as he, as Paul was. And still is. He he said it would be my swan song. I could I could do it again once more. And I no 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 no. I I I'm uh, you know do you, my we're because of my age and in my fifties as I am. I'm I'd like to be sort of semi-retired, semi sorry, um, but I'm not really. And I I would I do want to just you know I want to. I think probably having that set of components allows me to. You know, I can I can let the the least attractive ball drop, and and the trouble is, none of them are very aren't very attractive. They're all great, um, but you know, there'll come a point where I at least I can componentize myself, you know, maybe, and and be able to step back from something. And I think that's different from saying to any one boss, right? Well, I quit, I'm done, because um, it would be, you know, pe- people. I there's a two or three journalists in our community that are in their 70s and it'd be quite nice to have a finger in the pie still here and there you know just to uh you know i got into this business because it never ever technology never change never stops changing as you know and so you're kind of always completely surprised by news well hopefully at least enlightened by news streams every single day and month so you know in, in 20 years time if I'm lucky enough to still have a couple of jobs, um, it would it would be still you know be good to you know to to, to juggle one or two. How but, how is the measurement in terms of success? Because I know having been in house yeah, as a full time staff member at at some journalist outlets, some of them are really focused on the metrics. Hey, how many clicks did you get? And we're we're adding up all your stories for the month. How many clicks each story guy? We're going to rank everyone here. And if you're at the bottom, you're gone. Is there that same pressure for you to keep up these contracts, to keep getting more gigs, to keep getting more assignments as freelance? How concerned are you about, I need to make sure that I'm getting eyeballs on this particular story that I'm working on? Um, I think the way it works with tech, well, with Tech Target in particular, um, they had a, a set figure which I was supposed to get over um, 
in any one month. And the first, this 14, 15, 16 years ago when I started, the first month we we got 70% of the the uh, target readership. And then for the last 14, 15 years, it's been over. So it's never been an issue. Um, the um, And I think, and I, I, I hate to use the example of Forbes, but the stuff that I would write might only get a few thousand or two or three thousand, you know, there are some of the, the, not all the hits are huge. And obviously within that readership group, you've got, or that editorial group, you've got, um, you've got people that will write about the, uh, the, the, the fact that the, the new iPhone doesn't have a headphone socket and, and those, you know, or, or there's a security breach on, uh, uh, on, um, on 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 some part of Chrome, and those stories could get hundreds of thousands of hits. And I think that the publishers, this is hopefully to answer your question, that it's not just on those two publications I mentioned. The publishers aren't always too concerned about the number of hits. They want the right story to have run. Um, so if I've done, you know, there's a it's kind of an expression. I, I can hear publishers trying to sell their site. So they say, well, you know that. That site, that story might only have three thousand readers, but it's the right three thousand readers because it's it's sys admins that implement these, these technologies and it's bio decision makers, and um, and that's so that you know we don't it doesn't not, not everything has to be some fantastically viral massive hit, um, you know. Funnily enough, with the, the uh, what's the thing recently, CrowdStrike, right? I happened to um, uh, I happened to run a story on, uh, on 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 internet monitoring just before the, uh, the the huge outage recently, and that you know that did okay. But you know um, the fun. The, I think the biggest story I've ever written was um, it was called "What's the difference between a software product and a platform?" And <laughs> and, and and so and that's not even news. That's that's an evergreen story. I think it was because that was, I think Zuckerberg was on the trial um, for, you know, privacy or whatever it was he was held up for. And he kept talking about the platform, the platform, the platform. And I, and I thought somebody should explain um, what the, uh, what the difference was between the product and the platform. But that's a, that's a dangerous area because and that was a very, very technical, carefully written story, but could, I mean, when it, when it wasn't, is what a lot of publications, as I'm sure you've seen, do, which is produce click clickbait stories, and you can still see reputable titles still running a news headline feature next week with what is open source, because they know people will Google it. Um, look, the second biggest story I did was the 13 types of data, because there's timestamp data and there's temp. Uh, geospatial and there's unstructured and semi-structured and there's and that of course there's not 13 there's 127 but we chose 13 and that was just a nice type of deconstruction so again that could be a dangerous type of piece to write because it's a it's a list article or listicle um so you know it's it's it's, it's difficult you've got to do something that's um that's creative but you you can't fall into the traps that the, the media are do fall into in the in this you know this high churn world of press that so, you know sometime if if, uh, if one of the major cloud hyperscalers does something significant um sites will run the story even if they know it's already run elsewhere because they have to have had share of voice uh on a, on a particular issue and share of voice is a term that's ever usually supposed to be used in the, on the media side. That's a PR term. So it's it's a funny thing. I don't know how much <clears throat> I don't know how much media is in a state of flux these days. It's uh, it, it would be a shame to see too much of the of the of the churn and the uh, you know stories that don't need to run, but that the, the publishers think they need to run just so they've got the the clicks. So you mentioned clicks. It's I, um, we try and do the value stories primarily before worrying about the clicks. Yeah, that's a good answer because I I see the pros and cons and it's the same kind of arguments, especially in, in certain niche, not niche, but like 
targeted professional services types of media outlets where it's, hey, we don't get a lot of clicks, but man, those 3,000 people, like I know those 3,000 people, that's the 3,000 people you want. There's, those are the guys with $100 million budgets. Like those are the individuals that you care about as opposed to maybe a 30,000 click article. So I'm just curious about, you know, the pressures that you get, whether it's internal pressures or pressures from companies that want to get written about or pressures from editors or the outlets. So, okay, you, know, you got a lot of stakeholders here that you're trying to balance. I, um, do you know what? My, my editors are quite, I mean, I've been around a while. They let me do mostly what I think, you know, I, they, they trust me to do the kind of, the right stories in, in the right situations. Um, yeah, you know, they, um, in terms of what the, the industry wants you to write about, you know, it's, it's, as you know, the last 18 months, two years has been AI, AI, AI. And it's been, you know, we, we will take anything but AI at some point, you know, because it's kind of, um, I, I can't believe it'll be quite as hype fueled next year. Hopefully some of it will be embedded. Um, but the next trend, um, you know, could be, who knows? It could be, we, we could see a resurgence in platform engineering. We could see, uh, we could, we could see open source go in a new way. I think open source is, become highly commercialized as you know so it's kind of like pure free and open source doesn't exist in enough instances um so i know i know that's not exactly what you're asking you're asking about what you know what should i cover when um there are times when we'll follow the lead of what the industry's saying and what all the news wires are crackling with and there are times when um i've got something next week on um what you know which is better uh, commercial off the shelf cots off the shelf software or um or custom custom built you know should you should you, should you always customize or how much stuff can you can you buy pre-packaged and that's not a um that's not come from a new stream that's just come from a you know going to endless seminars and webinars and, and conferences and hearing people say and hear hearing vendors say you don't have to customize our stuff. It's great out the box because um, they want you to stay on their platform and not veer off it. Because if you customize too much, you can't uh, you can't pay for all the upgrades. So I'm like, well, that's an issue. But nobody's nobody's sending me that as a story. I just think it's a story that needs to be told. So it's very it's very difficult. Um, there aren't many days when there's absolutely I don't think there's any days where there's nothing to write about. It's just always stuff, isn't it? I a couple of questions from that. You mentioned AI, right? You said no one wants to write about AI anymore. When you get any pitch or story idea about AI, do you actively try to avoid it because you feel like this is just overly saturated and I'm tired of it? And then I'm curious, has the AI story readership gone way down now in, in the sense that you're not going to get as much traction if you write about AI? I would just try and answer them as in reverse. I, I would yeah. think that the readership is declining. I don't track every reader number everywhere. I think naturally people must be getting a little jaded. Um, do I avoid them? No, I don't avoid them at all. Um, but I would, what I, what I would try and do with any given AI story is, um, you know, it's so much better if it's, if it's a AI engine that explains how it uses vector database techniques to to be able to to triangulate three, four, five different facts together um, and create a new angle, so it's it's you know have we got or sorry if a vendor says you know we have a new AI tool or we have a um, you know it's the, yeah those those we're trying to sidestep slightly um, the ones that we like are um you know the i think um it may have been this morning or tomorrow or tomorrow, day before i can't remember when i wrote this um uh if it, it, it's uh, it's if when we see ai tools being used not for necessarily users but for for the software engineering community it's quite nice to see what's going on um within code bases and see how we it's not um people being worried about AI and whether it will take their jobs away is actually not just making people's jobs better, but it's making software engineers jobs better. That that's, 
I mean, I don't think that story will get bought off for a very long time because that's creating better apps and better um, better services. And I think the story I wrote last year is why do we still need more applications? Because they, we just don't have enough developers yet. So all the AI that injects itself into the um, in, into the tools used by the developers, operations, DevOps, all those uh, attack services that that's still interesting. I mean, don't avoid them, but you know, I mean, everyone's got an AI announcement, haven't they? That is a everybody. Good Every I, I have an AI announcement, right? You have an AI announcement. Uh, before we and we're going to get done with AI in a second, but I'm curious: Are you using AI yourself for any of your actual work, helping you write, edit headlines, any of that? No, none whatsoever. Okay. Um, I, I uh, occasionally, if I've, uh, if I'm googling. What does X company, XYZ company do? Um, Google has started to take over the answering process with its generative answer straight in the in the, in the web search results. So, so that would be my only version of yes. And otherwise, it's no. I mean, I, I uh, in the sort of closed press groups um, that we have on on. Um, on WhatsApp or Facebook or wherever they they are, um, with people talking about use of AI. No, uh, the ju journalists are. Um, it, it's abhorrent to anything we would do at the moment. And I quite often I might finish something uh, and tweet it. Um, sorry, I'd still say tweet. Uh, and uh, so, well, you couldn't AI wouldn't write that headline. It just can't right now. Um, would it be able to in the future? I guess maybe, but I think there's. I, I, I don't, as you know, from any time you typed anything, you've seen Gemini or Bard or chat GPT, it's only regurgitating what we're putting there. And I think that's, that's the antithesis of anything we do in press, I hope, because we don't want plagiarism. So it would be, uh, it would be impossible to use something that had been computer generated, or that had been auto generated, unless it was a, a, a quote or, you know, it was a description that was two lines long and was actually phys uh, technically accurate. We wouldn't, we wouldn't want any of it. Sure. I mean, I mean, you spoke, isn't that, uh, am I not saying whatever, what every other journalist? I've, I've heard some different things. I've, I've heard some people say, no, we're, we're embracing it. It's helping us be more efficient. It's helping us, you know, maybe it's a draft and we edit it, or maybe it's pointing things out. So I think yours is the, I say the main answer, but I have heard some different answers along the way. Well, that's a bit of a purist, old old school answer. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, um, no AI can can inject itself into my email all it likes. That if it's going to start helping to to answer, you know, that that's great. I mean, it doesn't go an awful lot further than Hi Eric at the moment. Not really. Right. Um, right. You know that, that it knows I'm talking to you. So. Um, I know, I know on your phone now, <clears throat> in some uh, email applications, some email clients, you can you can ask uh, for your e your 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 email answer to be cleaned up, uh, and um, I never think that it's better afterwards. I think it's I think it dilutes my hopefully slightly. Don't I don't take myself too seriously, and I'd hate a more sanitized version of an, e of an email answer to come from me. I I'd rather be slightly silly somewhere along the line and let people know it's generally, ge genuinely me answering the email. The, the thing that you mentioned about uh, right off the shelf versus the custom software, and you made a good point, the off the shelf guys don't want you to customize it because they want you to get the upgrades later, right? You, you gave that example. It made me think about when you're writing stories and you have to pick a side, let's say, or you have to sort of bent it one way or the other, how delicate are you in terms of, you know, not pissing off the other side, right? Because maybe it's, it's like you said, maybe if that had been in a story about all oh, the pros and cons of this or why a company is doing that, and it's like, hey, well, these off the shelf guys, they don't want you to customize because they're going to lose that upgrade money, right? How do you, A, write what you believe, but then B, deal with, Hey, I don't want to anger these people because I might need them in the future. Do you know, Eric? I know. What, I think I know what you're asking. Yeah. It, they, all the good companies, and they can all be good. They love it when you 
insert a slightly cheeky jibe in, you know, um, a big ERP vendor thinks you should be best of suites and best in platform and stay in line with his roadmap. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, they would say that, wouldn't they? And then you, you kind of make a joke about their sort of, well, clear, clearly that's their market that's their technology proposition and what they go to they go to the customers with and uh for a certain amount of you know a high percentage of customers go for it because it's the easiest thing to do uh and if you make if you make fun of the of the vendor um and you do it well you do it intelligently they usually love it they they i don't have to take sides they know you're um covering their story with a bit of tongue in cheek going, well, yeah, there's that install base that you can't get rid of, and they know they can't migrate. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> why do you think some government agencies in the U.S. have databases that they installed 35 years ago because they can't get rid of them? It's kind of like, well, you've still got that uh, service support income stream, haven't you? Um, and, you know, the, the, they, they they know it. And, and do you know what? They like being taken to task and and made intelligently technically fun of uh they and, and and when a vendor does that and comes back to you with uh they generally and i mean this could be anybody from microsoft to salesforce to oracle or whoever they when it, and i've had them right back but that was a bit cheeky i like the way you keep us on our toes they know that we're there to have a bit of a bit of a pop as we would say in the uk uh and they like it they really do. I guess I've been dealing with some different companies then. <laughs> Wait, I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know. Maybe I do it. Um, I don't know. Uh, they, uh, I mean, no, I, and in as an equal number of instances, I've had people saying, um, <laughs> they write to you saying, you know, could you change that line? And, you, and you know, you don't. You, you, you don't. You, you, if it's factually correct, which hopefully it always is, you do get people saying, can you not refer to our, it's usually a branding thing. They don't like, you know, people say, you know, I'm sorry, our company name is spelled capitals. And then you, you write back and say, no, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know who, you, who you've dealt with, Eric, but um, the, um, the, there's generally quite a good natured level of banter. Um, and you know, the companies that like that kind of interaction because they, um, you know they'll they'll start their pre their press conferences and they'll address certain people. Or they'll they'll start their main keynote say and they'll and they'll say thanks for the media for coming. They know they're putting themselves on the line. Um, yeah. But to to give a really whole uh, wholesome answer to your question, I think probably staff journalists might write a more barbed story more often than than a. Than a freelancer i think that's the case um right. i think the staff writers feel like they've got the the publishing house to fall back on and i i haven't i've only got myself so yeah. although I i've seen time, circumstances where that publishing house needs advertising revenue and the company that provides the advertising revenue is not happy with the staff writers report yeah i've been there i've been, I've been at magazines that have closed yeah <laughs> it happens yeah um but i mean you know i i, I don't know i mean things, a lot of a lot's changed isn't there because there's not just advertising these days there's there's quite a few um publications that have you know m media contracts or sponsorship contracts you know the kind of thing i mean they they you know they do a certain amount of paid for material um and they'll bleed it in with the with the news um mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I, again, I I don't have to get involved with any of that, which is why I didn't ever want to really go back and worry about uh, flat plans, page budgets, and you know, printing schedules. And then, last thing before we go, what is let's say the story that you would love to have on your desk? What is the one assignment that you wish you could do that someone would tell you, hey, here's this pitch or here's this assignment, here's this request that that you haven't been able to do yet? Do you mean just 
anything anywhere any yeah, a dream story that that's that's on your mind that you wish you just said i could just drop everything in and do this god um uh that's such a bit it's a hard one um i guess who would be the most important code person to ever be with us in in recent i mean i i, I if you if you if i got offered um uh bill gates explains coding method how coding methodology works in his in his heart and his mind that would be it like he's i've never met or interviewed him i've tried to follow software application development as as a core discipline and that you know bill bill gates explained why he wanted to code <laughs> that would be it maybe we can make it happen maybe that's it that's we've got Another 15 to 20 years of you still working. Let's see if we can get that. that maybe five to 10. I, I can't tell if the smaller number is the better outcome or the bigger number is the better outcome. That's the thing. I, I you know, when I, I, when I, I've got, a, I've got so many keyboards, I'm trying to get my, like, you know, my, my miniature computing resource. Like when I can work on a beach somewhere, I'll do it for the next 20 years. So why do yeah. you have so many um, keyboards? What's going on there? It's um yeah I'll be um I'll be I'll be doing it for a while for sure. So we have some time. You and Bill Gates with the sit down, the exclusive coding methodology sit down. Yeah. Oh well, that would be good. Um, well, you know I, I met a lot of. It's, it's been a very strange year actually. I've done a, I've done a lot of CEOs, and I didn't used to. I used to always ask for the um, you know the, the head of developer evangelism, um, but um. I don't want to go through all the names, but you know, some of the very big vendors, um, that's, I'll pick a couple SAP and red hat. They both have CEOs that were software that were absolutely were software engineers. Well, that's probably where the Bill Gates comment comes from. It's kind of like if the person running the, the company, uh, actually came from, you know, real hardcore command line first principles. Then those are those are really really good, um, and funny enough, one of those two guys uh, recognised me from when he was only a product manager, and that was really really good. It made me feel like you know, gosh, I've shown my age, um, but uh, you know, it's 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 uh, it's good to 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 talk to those people about what drove them and how they're in, you know, because they they don't they no longer code. So how do, how are they inspiring the the whole team below them, you know, and right. do they, do they, do they still have to, um, what's the expression? Show their chops. You know what I mean? Know their chops. Sorry. Um, cause otherwise how can they lead, uh, a platform development program if they don't know how it works themselves? So th those are the, those are the good guys. It doesn't have to be Mr. Gates. It could be any, uh, any one of the big, big, uh, pick anyone from the top 20, I guess. There we go. This is a big tent over here. Adrian, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much and, and appreciate it, especially because I know it's a lot later there. I think we watched the sun setting there in England. So Sorry about that. Yeah, we've yeah. just got, I'm right on the River Thames. So I, um, the uh, we're very lucky. I live in the old wharf, um, which you'll bite here. Helicopters going past because there's a, there's a London helipad just there. But this is, this building was Booth's Gin Factory back in the day and so we're right on the war front uh where the ships used to come in which means that the sun comes down and hits me so that's that's the real thing i see the sunlight but could not hear any helicopter noise at all so you've got some good microphones there ah no yeah we're next to london heliport which is great until uh the royal ascot horse racing meeting when all the rich people get to fly in and in and out every 10 minutes it's like a like a war zone here, you know, just uh, <laughs> not, in a, not in a good way. But um, yeah, no, it's great. Um, it's really nice being here on the river, but I'm very lucky I get to spend a good amount of time uh, with my US family in, in Maryland, um, which I know how to pronounce properly. Yeah, it um, sounded American the way you said Maryland. It, it's like your accent went away for that one word. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I'm there, I have to uh, I have to slip into a little bit, bit more of the local... Uh, local lo local patter so to speak um but you know you don't you don't want everybody uh every time you walk into a store go like oh my god where are you from you know you just kind of you, you want to blend in a little bit um 
which is why my wife wanted to live in quite central London, because uh, I think we've got a quarter of a million Americans in the city. Um, I think so. It's, it's, it's quite, I think it's one in 50, I read. It could be wrong. But um, there's, um, there's, yeah, they, they don't, uh, nobody looks at you wherever you're from here. So it's, uh, um, it's good. It's good. It's a good multicultural blend as well. I love it. Thank you, Adrian. Appreciate the time today. Eric, thank you. You've got a, such a different set of questions. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Very interesting. Thanks very much as well. Thank you to my guest and thanks for listening. Subscribe to get the latest episodes each week and we'll see you next time.